Um, <laughs> you guys already know that Jeremiah is a very heavy book. Lots of lamenting, lots of calls to judgment, and then back to lamenting, lots of judgment again. So there's more of that here in chapter 9. But hang on, I think, um, you know, it, it, it's good. It's good, you know, this is God's word. And maybe he says it to us so often because, you know, we don't want to hear it. And maybe we don't get it, just how important it is to hear these words of warning. So um, I'm going to pray. I'm going to look at Jeremiah chapter 9. Heavenly Father, uh, please tune our hearts to your words. Help us to hear it, not reject it. And help us to respond in a way that is um, fitting towards it. Uh, that repentance, that sadness that it calls for, help us to feel the weight of that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is Jeremiah chapter 9. Uh, oh, that my head were a spring of water, and my eyes a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. Oh, that I had in the desert a lodging place for travelers so that I might leave my people, go, go away from them. For they are all adulterers, a crowd of unfaithful people. So two oaks, you know, two whales. The first whale is just sadness, you know, and my eyes are like, like a fountain. <laughs> just constantly nonstop sadness and weeping over the death of his people. And it's just so sad, so tragic. But then there's verse 2, the second O, oh, whereby he says, Oh, I can't stand this. He wants to run away. He wishes that there is this hotel in the desert, far away, far away from his people, because he can't stand their unfaithfulness. He calls all of them adulterers, people who have um, forsaken their marriages, been unfaithful to their spouses. Well, that's what they've done to God, and he can't stand it. So two extreme reactions from this one prophet verse 3 they make ready their tongue like a bow to shoot lies pew, 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 pew. imagine instead of arrows it comes out lies uh, it is not by truth that they triumph in the land they go from one sin to another non-stop <laughs> they do not acknowledge me declares the lord beware of your friends do not trust your brothers for every brother is a deceiver and every friend is a slanderer. Friend deceives friend, no one speaks the truth. And they've taught their tongues to lie. They weary themselves with sinning. They live in the midst of deception. In their deceit, they refuse to acknowledge me, declares the Lord. Now, these lies are not just saying that they tell fibs to one another. You can't trust them, you know, like, um, What's the weather like today? Uh, it's sunny and it goes raining. It's not that kind of thing. Be because it equates lies with slander, equates lies with the rejection of God. And so therefore, what these lies are, are lies about God. So people who talk about God to one another, but in an untruthful way. And that's, that's the kind of lies that he says characterizes all these people. Meaning they're actually all talking about God but in an untruthful, unfaithful way. Verse 7, Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty says, See, I will refine and test them, for what else can I do because of the sin of my people? Their tongue is a deadly arrow. It speaks with deceit. With his mouth, he speaks cordially with his neighbor, but in his heart, he sets a trap for him. So, he, so he's buttering up his neighbor in order to take advantage of them. Should I not punish them for this, declares the Lord? Should I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? Verse 10, I will weep and wail for the mountains and take up a lament concerning desert pastures. They are desolate and untraveled, and the lowing of cattle is not heard. The birds of the air have fled and the animals are gone. So all life has been erased from this land. And because of that, God laments over this tragedy, this loss of life. And yet, it is God who caused this destruction, this judgment to fall on the land. Verse 11, I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a haunt of jackals, and I will lay waste the towns of Judah so that no one can live there. Verse 12, what man is wise enough to understand this? 
who has been instructed by the Lord and can explain it? Why has the land been ruined and laid waste like a desert that no one can cross? In other words, why do you think this judgment has come? And essentially, God is saying, no one will be able to answer this question. You know, who is wise enough? Who has been instructed by me? Who, who have I told the reason for this? Meaning, people won't see the connection between their sin and God's judgment for their sin. They will be clueless. Verse 13, the Lord said, it is because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them. They have not obeyed me or followed my law. Instead, they have followed the stubbornness of their hearts. They followed the Baals as their fathers taught them. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. See, I will make this people eat bitter food and drink poisoned water. I will scatter them amongst the nations that neither they nor their fathers have known. And I will pursue them with a sword until I've destroyed them. So they don't see that it's because they've rejected God and rejected God's law is one and the same thing, that therefore God pours out his judgment on them. And if you understand this answer with the question earlier on, why is the judgment coming? It's saying almost that the judgment reveals their sin. It's saying almost that the judgment teaches us about this kind of sin. That means for us here who are reading this, do we see the connection? that God judges us for our idolatry. You know, it's, it's speaking to the person who pursues idols, who's unfaithful to God, who ignores God's word and thinks it's okay. That, that's not a, such a big deal. And God is almost saying, look at what happened here. Do you get why I'm doing this to this people? Verse 17, this is what the Lord Almighty says, consider now, Call for the wailing women to come. Send for the most skillful of them. So there's this particular skill of this professional wailing women, usually people whom you employ at funerals to create that atmosphere of sadness. Let them come quickly and wail over us until our eyes overflow with tears and water stream from our eyelids. The sound of wailing is heard from Zion. How ruined we are. How great is our shame. We must leave our land because our houses are ruined. Almost to teach us how to lament, to teach us how to be sad over our own sin. Verse 20, now women, these wailing women, professional uh, mourners, hear the word of the Lord. Open your ears to the word of his mouth. Teach your daughters how to wail teach one another a lament. Death has climbed in through our windows and has entered our fortresses. It has cut off the children from the streets and the young men from the public squares. It's almost preparing them for this inevitable destruction that will destroy all life, children and young men. God is almost saying, I'm going to give you a real reason to wail and to lament, not because you want to earn money from going to this funeral to create this atmosphere. No, I will create that atmosphere and therefore you will lament. Verse 22, say, this is what the Lord says, the dead bodies of men will lie like refuse on the open field, like cut corn behind the reaper with no one to gather them. You know, cut corn, you know, you harvest all this corn and then you just leave it there. <laughs> on the ground uh, and that's what the bodies are going to look like all these men and he says this to the women all your men you know maybe your husbands your fathers your brothers you know all your men are going to perish and you will be mourning over them verse 23 this is what the lord says let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the strong man boast in his strength or the rich man boast of his riches but let him who boasts, boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, righteousness on the earth, for in these I delight, declares the Lord. It's boasting in knowing God's character of you know, kindness, justice, righteousness. And it's not just saying, oh, God loves to show righteousness and justice and kindness, but it's saying, therefore, hey, I should display this justice, righteousness, and kindness. And therefore, that's why you 
God loves and or at least allows this kind of boast. And I say, okay, I know God this way. God is this kind of God, and therefore I should reflect this kind of character of God in my life. Because every other kind of boast is in ourselves and not in God. You know, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom or his strength or his riches. And it's saying that these things are empty boasts. They don't mean anything to God. You know, that achievement that we had you know in our career in our even in our education getting those degrees or things that make other people you know admire you God almost hates that but the only thing that God will almost allow or even delight in is the fact that we know him and therefore we know we have this relationship with him verse 25 the days are coming declares the Lord when I will punish all who are circumcised only in the flesh, Egypt, uh, Judah, Edom, Ammon, Moab, and all who live in the desert in distant places. So God's going to punish all these other nations who don't know him, who are circumcised only in the flesh. Now, that's kind of weird because Jewish people are circumcised in the flesh. That, that's the idea. It's, it's something that you do to your bodies as a mark that you belong to God. But God applies this to Egypt, Edom, Ammon, Moab. But in between, you notice Judah, verse 26. In between, suddenly Judah is slipped in among, amongst the nations. Meaning, in God's eyes, you know, his own people are no different from all these nations. For, verse 26, all these nations are really uncircumcised and even the whole house of Israel is uncircumcised in heart. Meaning, you guys are no different from all these other people who don't know God. Even though you have this physical mark on your bodies, it doesn't mean a thing to God because your hearts don't, do not have this mark of relationship, do not have this mark of holiness and relationship with God. Um, what do we learn from this? <laughs> um, you know, today I was, I was, I had Bible study today with some friends and I was saying, you know, whenever you give bad news to a friend, uh, my temptation is to go, oh, but actually it's not that bad. You know, yes, this is serious and yes, God's judgment is real, but you know, I'm sure it's, you are okay. I'm sure you realize you're wrong. But I realize passages like this teach me not to rush there too quickly. Yes, the destination ultimately is Christ and His forgiveness and His restoration. And, it, and it's so good that because He took our judgment upon Himself, we won't have to face this kind of judgment. But the route towards getting there is realizing that we do deserve this, that we are like this, that our hearts have this kind of stubbornness that just will want to ignore and reject and turn away from God again and again and again. And so if you were to read this, not just for yourself, but in a Bible study group with a few, a bunch of other people, hopefully what happens as you read this, you know, repeated refrain of wailing and lamenting and judgment is that one by one, everyone starts getting it. Hey, this is us. Hey, this is serious. And hey, we need to repent. And there's a kind of knock-on effect if not just you, but your brothers and you, your sisters and you start to get it that, hey, we need to turn back to God. This is so serious. Our church, our nation needs to turn back to God. And then we come to Christ. Only then, I think, does Jesus' forgiveness and his salvation make so much more sense and taste so much more sweeter. I think that's the valuable um, nature of this kind of passage that brings us through this root of confession and acknowledgement and submission before God because of our sins and receive because of his goodness his mercy his kindness his justice through Christ yeah, yeah. Heavenly Father uh, help us not to rush through our repentance help us to see how we need to be turning to you every moment of the day and therefore, to receive again this forgiveness and this reconciliation and this goodness through Christ every moment of the day. Thank you that that too is true. And thank you that we can boast in that, that we know Christ and his forgiveness, his death and his resurrection. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.